So the first five books of the Bible are Genesis, which covers the creation of the world and the lives of the ancestors of Israel, then Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, which concern the life of the prophet Moses, his leadership of the Israelites, and the laws revealed to him by God. Together, these books are known as the Torah, meaning the law in Hebrew. Though in this video, I'm going to call it by its other common name, the Pentateuch, which is just Greek for five books. The Pentateuch is traditionally believed to have been written entirely by Moses himself under God's guidance. However, there are some issues to this idea. There are a number of passages in the Pentateuch which suggest it was composed after the death of Moses, most notably Deuteronomy 34.5, which describes the death of Moses. On top of that, there are other narrative quirks throughout each book that put the whole idea of a single author into question. There are several doublets, that is, a piece of information or story provided twice in the same text, often with differing details. In Genesis chapters 12 and 20, we see two stories where Abraham visits a foreign country and tells everyone that his wife Sarah is actually his sister. The king sees Sarah, says boy yo yo arf 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 awuga, and tries to take her as a wife. But then, God exposes Abraham's lie before the false marriage can be consummated. This story even repeats a third time in chapter 26 with Abraham's son Isaac and his wife Rebekah. Another doublet in Genesis is the story of how Jacob's name was changed to Israel. In chapter 32, Jacob, on his way to reunite with Esau, wrestles with an angel. Or maybe it was God, I don't know. After successfully pinning down his opponent, the divine being renames him Israel. But then in chapter 35, after Jacob brings his household to Bethel, God visits him and once again renames him Israel. Israel. In addition to redundancies in the form of doublets, there are also just flat-out contradictions. In Genesis 6, God tells Noah, quote, Of every living thing of all flesh you shall bring two of every sort into the ship to keep them alive with you. Of the birds after their kind, of the livestock after their kind, of every creeping thing on the ground after its kind. Two of every sort will come to you to keep them alive. But then in chapter 7, Noah gets different instructions, quote, You shall take seven pairs of every clean animal with you the male and his female. Of the animals that are not clean, take two, the male and his female. Also, of all the birds of the sky, seven and seven, male and female, to keep seed alive on the surface of all the earth. This is not an exhaustive list of all the issues, I'm actually bearing the lead on a couple more big ones in Genesis. But I hope it effectively shows that the Pentateuch is a problematic text if you try to read it as the work of a single author. Theologians have been well aware of this problem for literally thousands of years, and they've had to find ways of reconciling this with their beliefs regarding the authorship and authority of the Bible. However, in the wake of the European Enlightenment, many biblical scholars began to reject divinely inspired mosaic authorship as a given. And instead turn to source criticism. Through analyzing the conflicting narrative threads within the text, a consensus emerged that the Pentateuch was actually the work of multiple authors, each recording versions of traditional legends from their time and place. These authors' works would later be compiled by a third party into the Pentateuch as it exists now. The most prominent model for the composition of the Pentateuch is that of the documentary hypothesis, which identifies four distinct voices throughout the text, each with their own narrative threads and other stylistic and thematic features which distinguish them from one another. There's the Yahwist source, known as J, named after its prominent use of God's personal name Yahweh, which was spelled with a J by the German scholars who identified the source, hence J instead of Y. The Eloist source, known as E, which in contrast favors the more generic term Elohim when referring to God. The name Yahweh doesn't show up in the E source until it's revealed to Moses in Exodus 3. The priestly source, known as P, named for its emphasis on ritual practices, the origins of religious sites, the genealogies of important figures, you know, stuff a priest would care about. P-text is most prominent in sections of the Pentateuch concerning these subjects. And lastly, the Deuteronomist source known as D, which is only found in Deuteronomy and makes up the vast majority of that book, if not all of it. These sources can be most easily identified in sections with the most glaring contradictions, of which I will now present two examples from Genesis. Hold on though, I need to dig up the lead now. Most people born into Judeo-Christian tradition could give you a quick summary of the creation story told in Genesis 1 through 2, but few look at it critically enough to notice the problematic sequence of events that it presents. Genesis 1 starts with a featureless earth submerged in water. On day 1, God, through spoken command, creates light, then separates the light from the darkness establishing day and night. On day 2, he creates the expanse of the sky, separating the earthly waters from the heavenly waters. Day 3, he raises dry land out of the 
the sea, allowing vegetation to grow. Day four, he creates the sun, moon, and stars and places them in the expanse so that time can be measured. Day five, he populates the ocean with fish and the sky with birds. And finally, on day six, he creates land animals, last of all being humans, specifically a male and female formed in God's image. The next chapter starts on the seventh day, where God rests, having finished all his work. But then on verse four, we suddenly jump back in time and immediately run into confusion. Quote, this is the history of the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created, in the day that Yahweh God made the earth and the heavens. No plant of the field was yet on the earth, and no herb of the field had yet sprung up, for Yahweh God had not caused it to rain on the earth. There was no man to till the ground. So at first it sounds like we've gone all the way back to day one, but then it describes the earth as a barren desert, which would have to mean where somewhere in the middle of the third day, after the formation of dry land, but before the appearance of plant life. God then creates Adam, the first man, by sculpting him out of soil and breathing life into his body. Even though according to chapter one, humans aren't supposed to show up till day six after several more stages of creation. Next, God plants the Garden of Eden for Adam to live in. He decides Adam should have a companion and now creates land animals and birds, two groups that in the previous chapter appeared on separate days, but now seem to have been created simultaneously. Adam names each animal, but can't seem to find a suitable companion among them. So God puts Adam to sleep, removes one of his ribs, and fashions it into a woman. Now there's controversy surrounding the translation of the word Selah to rib, as many of you have informed me. I'll talk more about that sometime in the future, but for the purposes of this video, we're just gonna go with the mainstream translation. All right, so Genesis 1 and 2 each provide contradictory accounts of creation. And even if you try and get creative with the meaning of the word day, the order of events for each story simply don't match up. Was man created before plants and animals or after? Were men and women made together or was Adam first and Eve second? There are a number of Jewish and Christian traditions that attempt to reconcile these issues, some of which I intend to talk about in future videos, hint hint. However, the documentary hypothesis proposes that the two creation stories are simply from two different sources that were not originally meant to coexist. Genesis 1-1 through 2-4a is attributed to P, the priestly source. As in many of the oldest creation stories, like those of Egyptian and Mesopotamian mythology, the earth begins as a formless ocean. God, referred to simply as Elohim in the Hebrew, is depicted as a distant, all-powerful being who creates simply by speaking his will and the universe abides. The process of creation follows a distinct pattern. In the first three days, God creates each major domain of the cosmos, night and day, the ocean and sky, and dry land. Over the next three days, those domains are populated with celestial bodies, fish and birds, land animals, and finally human beings who are granted stewardship over the earth and its creations. The seventh day where God rests is an outlier and serves to establish the Sabbath, the Jewish holy day, using narrative to reinforce religious customs as a hallmark of the P source. Halfway through chapter two, verse four, we switch to the J source who gives us another creation story. You can pat yourself on the back of the sudden use of the name Yahweh tipped you off. In Jay's account, the earth starts out as a barren desert. Jay's depiction of God is much more grounded and anthropomorphic. Instead of simply commanding Adam to exist, he takes soil and physically sculpts his body and then breathes into his nostrils to give him life. Eve too has to be created manually from pre-existing materials. Also, plants and animals are now created specifically to serve humans, unlike in P, where they were created for their own sake, and then later humans showed up to rule over them. The J source continues further, covering the entirety of the Garden of Eden and Cain and Abel stories, until chapter five, which picks up right where P left off as if none of the other stuff happened. Now, whoever it was that put the P and J creation stories together in one manuscript obviously would have noticed the ways they conflict narratively. Probably more important to them, though, were the ways that the two sources served to complement each other thematically. P provides a broad overview of the formation of the whole cosmos, emphasizing the structure and order God brought to it. Then Jay tells a more grounded story, focused squarely on humans and their relationships with each other and God. In this first example, it's pretty easy to separate the sources from each other because they're presented in distinct blocks without any intermingling. But in Genesis 37, which tells the story of the enslavement of Joseph, the situation gets more complicated as we see two sources woven together to form one narrative. The story, as presented in the complete text, goes, Joseph was out tending sheep with his older half-brothers. Afterward, he came to his father Jacob, 
claiming the others were misbehaving. And this is why your brothers don't want to hang out with you, Joseph. Even so, Joseph was Jacob's favorite son, and he gave him a fancy coat, causing his brothers to become jealous. Later, Joseph told his brothers about two prophetic dreams he had. One where they were all binding sheaves of wheat, when suddenly his sheaf stood upright, and his brother's sheaves formed a circle and bowed to his. And another dream where the sun, the moon, and eleven stars bowed down to him. The implication behind both dreams being that Joseph would one day rule over his family, something that his already jealous brothers were not super jazzed to hear. Sometime later, Jacob commanded Joseph to go supervise his brothers who were once again out tending sheep. When the brothers saw Joseph coming from afar, they decided to murder him, hatching a plan to hide his dead body in a pit and tell their father he was killed by an animal. However, Reuben, the oldest brother, heard them conspiring. He implored that they instead throw Joseph into the pit alive and avoid physically harming him in the process. That way, his death wouldn't be on their hands, if only by a flimsy technicality. However, Reuben was secretly intending to come back later and rescue Joseph. When Joseph arrived, his brothers seized him and took off his fancy coat. After tossing him into a pit chosen by Reuben, they then sat down for some lunch and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites passing by on their way to Egypt. Judah then said, quote, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not let our hand be on him. Note that Judah here seems to be proposing an alternative to killing Joseph with their bare hands, even though Reuben already talked them out of that. That's why they threw him into the pit alive. Regardless, Judah's plan is never realized, because in the very next verse, a group of Midianite merchants pass by Joseph, pull him out of the pit, and they sell him to the Ishmaelites. The Ishmaelites then took Joseph with them to Egypt. And we're simply not told why Joseph's brothers, who presumably would have seen all this happening, didn't intervene. Later, Reuben returned to the pit only to discover it empty, and he went to his brothers to tell them that Joseph was missing. Again, even though they all should have been right there when the Ishmaelites bought him from the Midianites. The brothers then dipped the fancy coat in goat's blood and brought it to Jacob, making him believe his son was dead. And then chapter 37 ends when, quote, the Midianites sold him, Joseph, into Egypt to Potiphar. A direct contradiction of before, where it was the Ishmaelites who bought Joseph from the Midianites, and they took him to Egypt. We see further confusion later on in the story, like in chapter 39 verse 1, where it says Potiphar bought Joseph from the Ishmaelites in accordance with the first version of events. And also in chapter 45 verse 4, where Joseph claims his brothers sold him into Egypt, even though they didn't. They planned to, but the Midianites got to him first. So the story beats of chapter 37 create a problematic narrative when presented all together. However, if you pick apart the text verse by verse, they can actually be separated into two complete and fully coherent narratives. One attributed to the J source, where Joseph's brothers hate him for being their father's favorite and want to prevent the prophecy of his dreams from coming true. They hatch a plan to kill Joseph, hide him in a pit, and tell Jacob that an animal killed him. Reuben does not intercede on Joseph's behalf. They seize their brother and take off his coat, but before going any further, they see the Ishmaelites passing by. Judah proposes selling Joseph to the Ishmaelites, and they do just that. The Midianites never show up at all. And their scheme is completed when they bring Joseph's bloody coat to Jacob. All later verses referencing this specific version of events are attributed to the J source. Meanwhile, the remaining verses of chapter 37 are attributed to E, the Eloist source, and form their own version of events where Joseph's brothers are pissed at him for tattling on their misbehavior. The stuff about Joseph Joseph's dreams and his fancy coat are never mentioned. When they see Joseph coming to supervise them again, they conspire to murder him. But Reuben steps in and introduces the whole idea of throwing Joseph into a pit as part of his scheme to save his life. The brothers follow along with this plan and then go off to eat. While they're occupied, the Midianite traders come and take Joseph completely unbeknownst to anyone else. The Ishmaelites don't show up. Then Reuben discovers the empty pit and tells his brothers. And meanwhile, the Midianites sell Joseph into Egypt, a statement that now makes perfect sense in context. None of the verses of chapter 37 need to be edited or reordered to form these two narratives. You need only isolate the text attributed to each source, and you have two complete stories with no internal contradictions or loose ends. Now, it's important to keep in mind that the documentary hypothesis is a hypothesis. Until someone discovers a complete J, E, P, or D manuscript somewhere, we can't claim to know that the Pentateuch was formed this way. Among proponents of the documentary hypothesis, hypothesis, there are differing opinions regarding which passages should be assigned to which source, and how they all ended up in the same text. And there are competing models, such as the supplementary hypothesis, which proposes that the Pentateuch originated as a single text that was gradually added to by different 
authors and redactors over several generations. There's also the fragmentary hypothesis, which to my understanding treats each small section of the text as potentially originating from its own source. But whatever different theories scholars subscribe to, the consensus remains that the Pentateuch, in some way or another, is a composite text produced by multiple authors. You'll be hard-pressed to find single authorship theories outside of religious apologetics. I should probably point out, though, that I am not a scholar, and this is by far the most complicated and potentially divisive subject I've tackled on this channel. Going much deeper would be biting off more than I can chew, so instead I'll just recommend some reliable resources if you want to learn more. On wikiversity.org, you can read the entire King James Version Pentateuch with the text color-coded based on its hypothesized source. Link in the description. The book, The Composition of the Pentateuch by Professor Joel S. Baden, presents the methodology used by modern biblical scholars to support the documentary hypothesis. He also addresses problems with earlier forms of the hypothesis and popular alternative models. Link in the description. Joel Baden also did a great hour-and-a-half-long interview on this same subject, which you can watch on the Digital Hammurabi YouTube channel. I'll leave it to you to figure out where the link is. And if you really want to dive into Hebrew Bible scholarship, there are actually a number of complete college lecture series you can watch for free on YouTube. I highly recommend Introduction to the Old Testament with Yale professor Christine Hayes, as well as The Hebrew Bible presented by Dr. Richard Elliott Friedman, who by the way is hilarious. Moses walks into a psychiatrist's office. He says, Doc, last night I dreamed I was the tent of meeting. He comes in the next day, he says, Doc, last night I dreamed I was the tabernacle. The doctor says, your problem is you're too tense. All of these scholars are a lot more qualified than me to talk about this stuff in detail. But they don't make goofy drawings, so I've got that going for me.